here and thank you very much uh, for inviting us and uh, uh, your family and the hospitality we enjoyed this morning so uh, good to be here um, and indeed uh, some of you uh, I haven't seen for some time and yet uh, uh, I've seen you uh, twice in a week uh, with the picnic last week and now being able to join together uh, today as well so uh, uh, thanks for your fellowship uh, it's good to get together and all the people said. Amen. Amen. That's all. I'll sit down. No, no, I, no I won't. No, I won't. Although I, I do want to talk about getting together. And uh, I wanted to start uh, in Philippians chapter 2, if you'll turn with me. <clears throat> There's a very well known verse here. It says in Philippians chapter 2, and reading in verse 12, it says, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, in this instruction, some may see a recognition that your life, your salvation, is in your own hands. Now, there's wisdom in that. It speaks of taking personal responsibility for your actions, for your choices, and for the direction that you uh, take in your life. The exhortation uh, to recognise that we, we own our ability to achieve salvation is both potent and wise. But, as I'm going to explore in more detail today, it would be wrong uh, to build on this direction to suggest that we can do it all on our own. That our lives our salvation is achievable and indeed must be achieved on our own. That lacks potency and it lacks wisdom. Now, of course, over the last couple of years, uh, to varying degrees, uh, uh, not only uh, in our homes but uh, across the world, um, we've experienced a form of life uh, that is starkly different from that which we have come to enjoy and value. The various uh, lockdown rules uh, have impacted on our lives uh, in many ways and in such things as our family life, our church life, our work, our recreation, our travel and uh, a range of many other uh, ways. And if nothing else, uh, I suspect uh, the lockdowns uh, the, well, the lockdown experience has reminded uh, us of the value of the small things that we do in life that together contribute to the meaning that we find in our day-to-day -day activity. Importantly, uh, the lockdown has impacted on, uh, I'll describe it as interactive human contact, right? being able to be close to each other. Right? In fact, it, you can't walk anywhere these da days without being uh, 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 told that we have to distance uh, from one another. Uh, it gets described as social distancing. Uh, and uh, and uh, look, uh, while understandable uh, as a, uh, a virtue in the fight against a virulent virus, uh, it is important to realise, as I'm sure we all do, that with social distancing also comes a denial of human, social and family contact that impacts, if not denies altogether, our ability to engage in collective behaviour. So there's a difference between what we do on our own and what we do together. So there's been an additional layer of solitude that has been forced upon us during the various reactions uh, to the virus's uh, impact on our society. And look, I'll, I'll, I'll speak for myself, and uh, maybe uh, others have felt this also, but for me, it was no fun, right? Maybe I'm saying the blindingly obvious. Uh, I hope I am. Uh, I didn't enjoy it. No, no not one little bit. Right? I sound like a little kid in a story. But uh, uh, no, I didn't enjoy it. And now, why didn't I enjoy it? Well, I'm sure that there were many reasons, but one area, and this is really what I wanted to focus on today, uh, is the degree of solitude that has characterised the recent experience. And when I was thinking about this, uh, in fact, I was thinking about it last year, and Barbara has heard some of these thoughts, so please bear with me, Barbara. But um, um, 
this, um, uh, there's a contrast between solitude and companionship. And uh, we might uh, contrast uh, what are often identified as the benefits of uh, being on your own with the benefits of doing things together. Not only in the context of uh, uh, the recent and uh, to a degree even ongoing unusual COVID restrictions, but more generally, generally in our life to just contrast the difference between those things that we do and indeed achieve, often with strength and vigour uh, on our own, uh, in contrast to those things that we do and we do well when we join with others. Now think about what it means to be on your own and what are often touted as the benefits of being on your own. So people talk about uh, uh, independence, they talk about freedom, whatever that means, uh, they talk about control uh, over what you do and when you do it, they talk about a simpler life, uh, free of the complexity that other people bring to you in your life. They speak about not having to put up with others. Uh, they talk about avoiding the emotional ups and downs of having someone else uh, uh, with you. Uh, and maybe they talk about greater self-awareness, uh, where you have to find your own inner strength uh, in circumstances where you're not able to either rely upon or draw upon uh, that strength of others. Now those issues, you often hear them raised in the context of a debate about whether I should marry or stay single. Uh, and you, when you think about it, you can see some merit in it. Uh, indeed, you might even remember that the Apostle Paul uh, spoke about uh, the benefit of being on our own and not uh, only doing things together with the spouse uh, and saying, well, you know, there are some distractions that come in your life uh, if you choose, uh, I think, wisely. Uh, for those who have that opportunity to uh, uh, be joined with another. Uh, but nevertheless, there are things that you can do on your own that you can't do uh, when you are together. So he talks about that, and that you can see the wisdom in that. But that's really not what I wanted to focus on. And indeed, uh, what, as I was thinking about these things uh, in the context of the imposed COVID solitude, um, I was thinking about our, our lives more bro broadly, whether we benefit from being on our own or whether we benefit from doing things together. And I think the reality is that the vast majority of fulfilling experiences in life are those which we achieve and experience with others. While there is always something in all of us that takes comfort uh, in what we can achieve on our own or you know, standing on our own two feet or using our two arms or our head or whatever it is that we uh, uh, bring to bear to uh, deal with the particular challenges of life, to rely only upon solitary activity is, I suggest, in many ways unfulfilling. That's not to say that you can't find meaning or fulfilment in an individual life, of course you can. But every time we engage with others in our life, we have a layer of experience that is difficult to achieve on our own. The added uh, vibrancy or, or colour uh, can be seen in the close relationships that uh, uh, we see in such things as marriage, where the marriage union has the potential to fashion each individual so uh, uh, in a, a fulfilling and a meaningful way. Similarly, when children enter your lives, for those who've gone through the joys of uh, uh, bearing children, does it impact on your individual freedoms and choices? Yes. Does it impact on your life? Yes. Uh, but I tell you what, when children enter, enter our lives, uh, we can experience uh, the joys and challenges of parenthood and we can recognise the additional layers of complexity and colour that that brings to our lives. So, yes, we can have the, a simple course. So yes, we can all cloister ourselves and be in some sort of solitude and we can achieve some things in life that uh, uh, bring meaning uh, to us and our existence, but a whole uh, colour to life comes as we do it together. Uh, and indeed, that's a, uh, you, you, you know the word monotonous? It's a good word, monotonous, when you think about it. It's monotonic, right? It's monotone. It's of a single colour. 
right? And one of the things that uh, has happened uh, through the COVID restrictions, I suggest, is that uh, you know life got turned into a bit of a beige colour, um, you know, a bit of a boring colour, and we uh, we we lost a bit of the vibrancy of life uh, and uh, that colour. Uh, because it was all monotonic, you're all doing the same thing all the time. Uh, and uh, within a confined space and often uh, with yourself or uh, a fewer number of people than uh, we would normally choose to interact with. And of course it's not only in terms of life's fulfilment that we secure benefit from being together, uh, but we also have the advantage that comes when we bring together two or more minds or two or more bodies who work together in pursuit of a common goal. So have a look in Ecclesiastes and chapter four, where Solomon uh, captures this uh, in some very well-known verses uh, in Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is sometimes called the book of joy. Uh, well, I tend to see it as a book of joy because it's about how, how, how you can find joy within the vanities of life. Uh, and it is a, a brutally honest portrayal of what life is about. Uh, because he, you might remember he goes through a catalogue of vanities, a catalogue of, of the emptiness of life, uh, and yet within it he also uh, brings the words of wisdom uh, that would point to how we can uh, find joy and meaning uh, in a life that is full of its vanities. Uh, and here in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 4, he speaks about uh, being alone or being together. And he says in verse 8, "'There is one alone and there is not a second. Yea, he has neither child nor brother, yet is there no end of all his labour. Neither is his eye satisfied with riches, neither says he, for whom do I labour and bereave my soul of good? This is also vanity. Yea, it is a sore travail. So he considers the one who works on his or her own and describes it as a sore travail. He says two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labour. Uh, there's something uh, better in life to be able to share the fruits of your labour with others and to not merely be doing it to serve yourself. For if they fall, he goes on to say, the one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him that is alone when he falls, for he has not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together and they have heat, how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Now the contrast here is stark. First, Solomon considers the vanity in personal toil that serves only oneself. There is a limit, he says, to the fulfilment in life that comes from only serving yourself. He says, let us be active, let us labour, but it's better for us if uh, that service is for the benefit not only for ourselves, but also for others. Serving a common good is better than serving a solitary good, is uh, the lesson that he starts with here. So he says two is better than one, uh, because they both can obtain the benefit of working together. Right? And in our fellowship, we enjoy that. And all the people said, we recognise the value that there is of working together, of not just uh, uh, expending our energies uh, uh, for our own personal gain, but rather recognising that there's a lot to be achieved as we serve a, a, a like-minded goal. Uh, and indeed, if that's a spiritual goal, all the better. Then we are told, that as you read through those verses, we're told that uh, there are other benefits of approaching life, uh, not only as one, but also with others. So the first one he says, well, you get mutual help uh, in a time of need, where the one uh, can lift up his fellow uh, when the other falls. And the underlying premise here is that we all fall sometimes in our lives. Right, that, he doesn't say it directly, but that's what he's saying. He says, it's all very well to you, for you to be on your own and to walk around in your own strength, uh, but you're going to fall down one day. Right? You're going to fall. And at that time, you benefit from having another to lift you up. Uh, Woe to us, says the preacher, if we face the fall alone. Right? We don't have to face life's uh, tripping of us up alone. Rather, we can do it with others. Then he gives the analogy of heat uh, and speaks uh, 
here of the uh, protection from the elements. Individually, of course, we all have the, uh, the heat. We've got a little heater inside us, uh, you know, and it, I think uh, we keep ourselves to about 37 point something degrees, if I remember rightly, 37.6 or whatever it's supposed to be. All right, so we've got our own little heaters uh, and we can withstand the elements to a degree. But alone, we succumb quickly to what the world might throw against us. Together, we can withstand the cold that bears down on us, uh, even in the face of a challenging environment that would otherwise uh, freeze us. Uh, we can achieve and uh, we can get the protection of, of, uh, of the heat of more than one in a stronger way than if we're merely facing the elements on our own. And finally, we're reminded that there are those who will work against us. So not only are there times in your life when you will just fall, and not only are there times in your life when uh, just the fact that you're in the world is going to work against you and the elements might be against you and you need the heat of others, but there will be times when some will actively work against you. And facing a foe on your own means you must overcome alone. Do it together and you are more likely to withstand the foe, says the prophet. Indeed, he uses the analogy, he says, a threefold cord is not quickly broken, which always reminds me of the Golden Gate Bridge. Don't know why. Right, uh, right, you know, it's a big suspension bridge. Right, and each of the little cords that hold up that huge structure um, uh, are wound together, right, and uh, I think each of the cables are about 90 centimetres, 92 centimetres, so about, uh, I would have been about a yard in the old measure, but a bit under a metre, right? And each of those is made up of 27,572 cables, right, wound up into something that is this big. And so each of those little cables is not achieving it but bringing it all together gives it an amazing strength. So, according to the Ecclesiastes, it's a no-brainer that we are better off doing things with others. That is always the, uh, the case uh, uh, that, you know, making friends and associates, pursuing like... Well, hold on a sec. Is it always the case that uh, making friends and associates or doing things in a like-minded way, way with others, is that always the better way to go? Uh, well, in Proverbs chapter 13, you can turn there if you wish, but it's just one verse. In verse 20, we're told that he that walks with wise men shall be wise. Okay, another example of why it's good to be together with others. But he says, a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Oops, hold on a minute. What does that suggest? It suggests, well, well in fact, I could be in a group that is actually bringing my destruction. Um, and, uh, uh, and maybe not all group activity is wise, is what we're being told here. And it suggests that there are qualifications on the view that we are always better off doing things with others. But it says, if you are a companion of fools, then you can reach an undesirable end in your life. Now that's expanded on in other parts of the scriptures, and maybe a couple of verses might show this. Matthew chapter 15, if I can take you there. Now, you might remember that Jesus uh, came with a clear message from God uh, as he sought to fulfil uh, the Old Testament law. Uh, and he was confronted by those who were the supposed experts in that, that law uh, and who uh, portrayed themselves as having some uh, status in both understanding and delivering uh, on the wisdom that was embedded in the law. And here, in Matthew chapter 15... We're told in verse 12 that his disciples came to him and they said unto him, do you know that the Pharisees were offended after they heard these, this saying? Right. So you can go back and read what it was he was talking about. But he said something that offended these religious leaders. They were described as the Pharisees. And Jesus answered and said, every plant which my heavenly father has not planted shall be rooted up. Leave them alone or let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, then both shall fall into the ditch. So again, reinforcing what we read earlier there in Proverbs, uh, is that if you're, in a, if you're a, a companion of fools, then you'll be destroyed. 
If you are amongst, or a, a blind person amongst the blind, allowing yourself to be led by the one who has no vision, then you will all ultimately fall into the ditch. And again, uh, in similar vein, he says in Luke chapter 6 and verse 39, uh, having spoken a parable to them, he says, Can the blind lead the blind? Shall they bo not both fall into the ditch? Now, I think this presents us a challenge. Because on the one hand, we see the advantage of being together, and on the other hand, we're given a warning. Um, and indeed, there are benefits of being together, but maybe we should be wary of who it is to whom we are joined. And um, uh, there's a, a, a very uh, powerful story in the Old Testament at the time when the children of Israel uh, were to come into the Promised Land. Uh, briefly, they were, in sl they were slaves uh, in Egypt. Uh, God performed miracles as he lifted up Moses to lead the people out of uh, uh, Egypt. They came through the Red Sea and all along there was this promise that they were going to... Um, uh, enter into the promised land, right? And remember, in Egypt, they were in terrible bondage. Uh, the Lord worked miracles uh, uh, at the hand of Moses, and that led to their escape. Uh, the Exodus looked doomed as they faced the Red Sea in front of them, but God prevailed. Once they crossed and found themselves in a pretty hostile environment, uh, God provided them water in the desert. They were given food or manna uh, in the desert. They scored a victory over the Amalekites, it's recorded in Exodus chapter 17. Uh, the, the law was given to them, the Old Testament law, uh, which reminds me of uh, this, this joke I heard, which I'm going to share with you. Right? I, I'm hopeless at jokes, but I'm going to share this one because I thought it was funny. Right? Who, who downloaded the first file from the cloud to a tablet? Answer, Moses. Got it? <laughs> You've got to be te technologically savvy here. You know, the cloud, that, you know, all that amorphous space where all the technological data is stored. And we download it down into our tablets. Tablet, right? Well, Moses did it he, as the Lord, anyway. If you, to, if you have to explain a joke, it's not a good joke, is it? Anyway. So, um, yeah, God, uh, the Lord was given on Mount Sinai. The Lord appeared in a fire and a smoke. Uh, the tabernacle was established uh, with God's glory appearing in the cloud that covered uh, the tent of the congregation. That's all in Exodus chapter 40. And, um, you know, this is pretty amazing stuff. This is a, a, an extraordinary um, a suite of miracles that was all calculated to achieve their escape, their survival, and their, as they went into the promised land, right? It's all very well to escape Egypt. The idea was not to die in the desert, so they got sustained in the desert. But the idea wasn't to get stuck there uh, or to die there. The idea was to go into the promised land. That's what it was all about. That's what the, uh, the promise was all about. And so they came to the promised land. And uh, there, there, there came a time when they were asked to... Uh, um, uh, and in fact, in Deuteronomy, you could turn with me here. Oh, I'm sorry, not Deuteronomy, in Numbers, Numbers chapter 13. So we'll pick up the story in Numbers 13 and verse 17. Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, and he said unto them, Get you up this way southward, and go up into the mountain. We've got the right reference. And see the land what it is, and the people that dwells therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many. And what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities they be that dwell in, whether in tents or in stronghold. And what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, and whether there be wood therein or not. And be you of good courage, and bring up the fruit of the land. Now, now the time of, was the time of the first ripe grapes. Now, first of all, it's important to understand the overall objective here. It was to go there and to see and to catalogue what was there. It wasn't to go there and see and uh, formulate a judgment as to whether it was a good place to go or not. Right? That, that wasn't the purpose of the spies. 
uh, as they went out into the promised land. It was to there and say, make an assessment there. You know, what, what are we going to face when we cross this uh, Jordan River? Uh, what do we have to deal with? You know, what can we look forward to? What are we going to have to meet by way of a challenge? Nothing in life is delivered on a plate. Uh, and indeed, nothing in life is perfect, despite those who might have utopian dreams of what might lie on the other side of the river. Right? Even the Lord's promise of the promised land was not going to be handed to them uh, like a plate uh, or on a plate uh, a, 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 as a meal. Uh, they were going to have to face the challenges of moving across. They would have to plan. They would have to uh, expend some energy. They'd have to think about it. They'd have to do it. Uh, indeed, they'd have to fight some battles. Right? That was all part of the bargain. It didn't undermine the promise that God had given them to enter into that land, but it was the nature of what it was that they were to receive. When they were to send out the spies, the idea was to put together a report, uh, we might call it a good report, that was able to recognise uh, what lay ahead of them, but not then infect it with fear so that they rejected what was on offer. And so it goes on. So they went up in verse 21. They searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rehob, as men come to Hamath. And they ascended by the south and came unto Hebron, where Ahiman, Sheshai, and many others, the children of Anak, were. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. They came into the brook of Eshkol and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they bear it upon two, <laughs> between two upon a staff. And they brought pomegranates and figs, and the place was called the Brook Eshkol because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down thence. And they returned from searching the land after 40 days. So they gave it a good go. They checked it out. They could see what it was and there were some good bits there. Uh, and so they went and they came to Moses in verse 26 and they gave a report. And to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We come unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. End of story. Let's pack our bags and keep on going. Right? Well, that's not what they said, right? But that's what they could have said. They said, Let's go in there. Let's do it. Right? Uh, but there's this word, and uh, uh, the, uh, so the next verse starts with the word but, except it must have been written by a lawyer. It actually says, Nevertheless. Right? It means the same thing, right? Um, so there's this big long but, uh, and nevertheless it's translated here, the people be strong that dwell in the land, right? So they qualified the land of, that was flowing with milk and honey and the report that was given uh, with what else might generate a negative reaction. They said they're strong and they dwell in the land, they've got walled cities, they're, they're very great. We saw the children of Anak, you know, these monster of people, um, the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites. They dwell in the mountains. The Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. Right? So, yeah, uh, you know, get scared is what they said. Right? Uh, uh, be very afraid, they might have said. And, uh, and now Caleb, and uh, indeed Caleb and Joshua stood against this. Right, and in verse 30, Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once. Remember, that's what I said that I thought they could have said after verse 27, but they didn't. Right? They added this nevertheless bit uh, in between. Uh, but Caleb says, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. And then they cut to the chase and just said, but. Right? Uh, they forgot the nevertheless and it became a but. Right? And in, the, in verse 31, but the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched under the children of Israel saying, the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eats up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, who come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers and so were we in, so we were in their sight. Um, and that's important, by the way, to both understand the importance of how you see yourself in the world as well as how others may perceive you. Uh, because here, uh, their vision was so messed up that they, we looked at ourselves and said, well, I'm just a grasshopper against these characters. Uh, I've got no hope. I can't do this. These guys are big. Uh, these guys are strong. Uh, they've got all these things. You know, it's just too much here. 
Right? Let's forget the fact that it's uh, the land that the Lord promised us. Let's forget the fact that uh, uh, his power was able to both overcome the uh, challenge in Egypt, was able to deal with the desert and sustain us along the way. Uh, let's forget the fact that he was the one who said we're going here in the first place uh, and that he then is well able to deliver uh, on this promise and allow us to uh, overcome uh, these fierce uh, people in front of us. No, they didn't say any of that. Right? They said, these guys are big and they're going to beat us. And um, anyway, the story uh, goes on, uh, and for the sake of time, we won't uh, go through it all. But in chapter, first, uh, chapter 14, uh, they, um, they murmured and they, 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 they cried and they, they, they wept, we're told, uh, during the night. And uh, uh, they, they then got angry with Moses and with Aaron. Uh, in verse 3, they say, well, look, you know, why has God brought us out here? Uh, to fall by the sword. Were we, look, let's go back to Egypt, they said. Uh, let us make a captain. Right? Let's get rid of this Moses guy. Let's get rid of uh, Aaron. and uh, Let's get somebody who will lead us and take us back into Egypt. Oh, that'll be fun. I, imagine how they would have received us. Remember, they, you know, we're the people who was responsible through our God that uh, uh, of all those people dying along the way as they chased us out of Egypt, right? You know, what a great well thought out plan that was right let's just go back into the mess that was our life before let's forget uh, the true nature of the life that we left uh, and uh, uh, and let's just let's just crawl back into the mud right and uh, as so many people do that in their lives don't they right they don't uh, perhaps physically go back to egypt uh, but they go back to their past life right? and they go back to it forgetting what it was like and they reject uh, the opportunity uh, a victory that God has set before them uh, and is so filled with fear or whatever else it is that they have fueled in their disbelief, they turn around and say, no, I'm better off going back to the old. And that's what these people did. And uh, it was fueled by the collective view, by the majority view. Right? And uh, uh, Joshua and Caleb, they tried their best. So in verse 5, they, they, they get up and they, Moses and Aaron, were, they fell on their faces, got a sore nose. and No, it didn't say that. Uh, they fell on their faces uh, and they were a bit uh, upset about it all. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. And they spoke unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. This is where we should be. And if the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us. A land which flows with milk and honey. Only rebel you not against the Lord. Neither fear you the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defence is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. Now that's sound counsel. Right? They are sound, wise words. But, in verse 10, there it is again. All the congregation, right? the majority of the people, bade stone them with stones. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before the uh, children of Israel. Now, uh, the, again, the, we won't read it uh, here, but if you read it uh, further uh, toward the end of chapter 14, the people compounded their sin. Uh, they suffered defeat in their disbelief. Uh, they, they got discomforted, right, which means they got smashed. And, um, uh, and uh, so it, uh, uh, it, it was a sad, sad scenario. And if you think about it, it's a classic example of how we need not, um, uh, well, we, we need to not necessarily take comfort in the majority view. Uh, now, in our modern world, uh, particularly in societies where we enjoy uh, in a democratic society, uh, uh, you know, some freedoms and uh, allowing voices to be heard and let the majority uh, rule, uh, we're taught from a, an early age of the virtues of the majority view. Now, uh, there's an interesting quote from uh, an American audio, uh, author, and uh, I think we've heard uh, similar things, but he says, uh, the two commonest elements in the universe are hydrogen and stupidity. Um, and uh, uh, we should not forget the power of the collective and how it can lead us astray. We're not called to be lemmings, blindly following those around us to our death. Rather, as an individual, we need to make our choices to get on board with those who are guided by the truth. And that requires us to get an understanding of the truth. Uh, and praise God, he's given us, uh, through his scriptures, a wonderful uh, 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 pattern uh, 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 of his wisdom and his truth and what we might do in our lives to be uh, part of that truth. 
Uh, he then promises to not leave us alone uh, regardless of our physical state and he gives us the spirit that dwells within. He calls it uh, not for uh, a, a, you know, a, an empty reason, he calls it the comforter right, uh, uh, that is within us wherever we may go. We can have that still small voice within us uh, that speaks to us and guides us and uh, directs us in our way. And through that spirit also he will lead us into all truth. And uh, what, a, uh, what a blessed state that we are uh, to have that and how we can recognise that even if the majority of the world doesn't believe what the Bible has to say, we can break out of that position and recognise the value in going back to the truth. It's interesting, you know, that uh, uh, later in Joshua's life, uh, uh, with a whole generation uh, departed some 40 or so years later, and they didn't see the promised land, and um, uh, if you go to Joshua chapter 1, it talks a bit about a different attitude of a generation that had learnt, it seems, at least for a little while, uh, from the uh, mistakes of the previous generation. Because they answered Joshua in verse 16 of chapter 1 in Joshua, saying, All that you command us, we will do. And whithersoever you send us, we will go. According as we hearkened unto Moses in all things, so we will hearken unto you. Only the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whosoever he be that does rebel against your commandment and will not hearken unto your words in all that you command him, he'll be put to death. Only be strong and of a good courage. And so we see here that there's, uh, there's been some learning that's happened here. Uh, and uh, all of this, of course, was dependent upon uh, the God being with the one who was leading. Turn with me to Psalm 122 and we'll uh, wrap some of this together. Here's a psalm of David as he rejoices. It's called the Song of Degrees, uh, which uh, uh, they say in one of the feasts as they ascended uh, uh, the steps that they would sing these songs, of a song of ascent. Uh, and as they're singing this song, Rejoicing as they came together in the Feast of the Tabernacles, it says, I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is builded as a city that is compact together. Great phrase, that uh, compact. It comes from a Hebrew word that talks about being coupled together. Uh, you know, with an engineering sense or mechanical sense, you might think about you know, how a train gets coupled together so that it, uh, you know, is able to pull loads between each other. Uh, well, that's what it's like. You know, maybe in an old agricultural sense, you talk about uh, yoking together two oxens, right? Coupled together. And it says here that uh, God's city is built as a place that is compact together and is uh, bound together as it works together for the Lord. Where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord unto the testimony of Israel to give thanks unto the name of the Lord. For there are set thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love you. Peace would be within your walls and prosperity within your palaces. For my brethren and my companions sake, I will now say peace be within you. Because of the house of the Lord, our God, I will seek your good. Now here he's talking about the, uh, being able to rejoice together that we are part of God's household, his kingdom, his family, uh, and here with an analogy to Jerusalem saying that uh, uh, we are bound together uh, in our work together and we are praying for this peace in our lives for our brethren and companions' sakes, right? Uh, uh, because we're all working together in a very strong way. Um, in, uh, uh, go back to um, Philippians chapter 2, which is where we started. Now remember I said that we were reminded of the, uh, uh, of the personal responsibility that we are to take uh, for our salvation. And uh, picking it up in verse 11, it says, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in, as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke 
in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither laboured in vain. Now, interestingly, of course, uh, as we work out our own salvation, as he told us there in verse 11, uh, it's with God working in us, because he says there in verse 12, for it is God which works in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. So we are not alone, even as we approach our salvation with fear and trembling. And moreover, he gives us the church so that we are not tossed to and fro by every cute idea or wind of doctrine uh, that might uh, come out of someone's imagination uh, as it inevitably does from time to time. And we'll finish on that in Ephesians chapter 4 where we're told about uh, how the church does help us in that. So there is an advantage in the collective even in dealing with uh, the, uh, those who in a, a different collective might bring an evil report against the word. Here he says he gave us some apostles in verse 11 of chapter 4 in Ephesians and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why did he do that? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry and for the edifying or building up of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Uh, this is said to be the information age, this world. It is extraordinary, the extent of the misinformation that, is, that characterises the information age. Right? Yeah, yeah, it just bamboozles you sometimes. You just don't know what you can or can't listen to or can or can't believe or how you sort through the mess. Well, there's a very clear message in the Scriptures and we ought to go back to that truth and build our lives upon the wisdom that we find within that uh, so that we are not tossed to and fro by whatever ideas that are being touted in this world, in whatever topic it might be. But speaking the truth in love, he says in verse 15, that we may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Why did he give us some within the church? That sort of suggests we ought to be in the church. Right? Why should we be in the church? Well, so that we can, uh, in a collective way, in a like-minded way, reinforce the strength of what it is that God has given us and taught us. So that we can uh, edify one another in that truthful state. Uh, so that, uh, uh, and then we can listen to the teaching uh, that can come in our direction. Uh, so that we're not like kids, uh, not like children, who are tossed and, you know, just take whatever idea everybody gives us, but rather we can receive it uh, according to the truth. And we can ultimately speak the truth in love. So, and we can grow up together in all things, it says, uh, uh, which is the head even Christ, from whom the whole body, right, this is what we're talking about here, the collective, the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, makes increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Now, if ever you've um, broken a bit of your body, uh, and I've done it a few times, uh, if you uh, break a bit, uh, then you understand what it's like if the bits are not fitly joined together. Right? Uh, and uh, it's amazing how ineffectual uh, the working of the measure of every part of your body is when even the smallest bit is not doing what it ought to do. And uh, uh, that's not the way the body of Christ should work. In contrast, it should work where each bit is fitly joined together and is therefore effectively working, even in the measure of what we are able to contribute, in the effectual working and the measure of every part. And what are we doing? We are making increase of the body of Christ. We are building each other up in love. And all the people say. That's all I want to say.